Hello friends, this is Jim with uh, Science Talk. Have some uh, news from the world of biology and evolutionary relationships. A new species of six gill sharks has been found. Where is the shark found? In the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic six gill shark is a deep sea dweller that gives birth to live pups. There are several forms of reproduction in uh, sharks. There is uh, sharks that uh, create an egg case, in which case the egg case is expelled from the oviduct and the embryo develops inside there and works its way uh, out of the egg case and swims free. There are some sharks that have eggs that actually develop inside the female, the pups hatch out of the eggs from there, then exit the oviduct and start swimming. And there are other uh, sharks that actually have what's called a yolk sac placenta, by which the uh, young sharks uh, nourish and develop until they're ready to uh, exit and swim out on their own. So several uh, strategies involved for the development of the uh, shark embryo and fetus. It was the Atlantic, so as I said, the Atlantic uh, six gill shark gives birth to live pups. It was long thought to be part of a global species of six gill sharks known as Hexanchus nakamurai. Hexa, prefix is of course means six. However, new genetic evidence reveals that it is a separate species. So researchers have dubbed the newly discovered shark Hexanchus vitulis. We show that the six gills in the Atlantic are actually very different from the ones in the Indian and Pacific Oceans on a molecular level to the point where it is obvious they are a different species even though they look very similar to the naked eye. This is a statement by Toby Dale Engel, a shark scientist at the Florida Institute of Technology. Six gills are named for the six gill slits they have for breathing, respiration more technically. Most shark species have just five. I'll get to the, this difference in a moment. The Atlantic six gill grows up to about 1.8 meters, six feet or so, and it is smaller than the 4.5 meter, approximately 15 foot sharks that make up uh, the Hexanchus nakamurai uh, species found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The largest six gills, the blunt-nosed six gill, Hexanchus uh, griseus, can grow up to nearly eight meters in length. So, what, what's the deal with the, the number of gills, pairs of gill slits? Most sharks have five pairs of gill slits. As you look on the side of their bodies, up in the anterior end, there will be five slits that you can see and when they respire they take in water water passes over the gill and the gills are on filaments oxygen is uh, absorbed uh, out of the uh, water taken up by the aorta and so forth however six gills have six pairs and this is a basically a throwback to an earlier form of sharks in typical chordates, chordates are the group of uh, organisms that include vertebrates, include humans, okay? but chordates will also include the agnathans, which are the jawless fish, such as lampreys and hagfish. It will include the uh, urochordates, hemichordates, uh, sea squirts, acorn worms, those kind of organisms. And in a typical chordate, there are seven gill arches. Okay, and these gill arches are located in the pharynx and hence pharyngeal uh, pouches they're referred to. And what typically happens is that, and if you look on a lamprey or a hagfish, you will see seven gill slits, pair, seven pairs of gill slits down the side of their heads. Typically, the first two gill arches Right, seven gill arches. The first two in uh, chordates that have jaws, the first two gill arches have become 
the upper mandible, the uh, upper maxilla, and the lower mandible. In other words, the first two gill arches have become your jaw bones. So having six gills plus an upper and lower jaws indicates an evolutionary side branch. There is even a seven gill shark species, the broadnose seven gill, and it is a real oddity. And it should be interesting to note that all six gill sharks have broad snouts. So going back to Hexanthus vitulus, the researchers compared mitochondrial genes of six gills from the Atlantic with the Indian and Pacific six gills. And now mitochondria are organelles that are found within each of the uh, eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are cells that have a defined nuclear region that is, or has its own uh, membrane, a nuclear membrane that defines the nucleus. And inside the nucleus is basically a genetic material. And mitochondria are basically uh, what's called the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, they use uh, ATP, adenosine uh, triphosphate, uh, for energy purposes. I'm not going to turn this into a biochemical uh, lecture, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so the mitochondria, basically, they, they produce the energy that the cell uh, needs to function. Now, mitochondria are carried strictly on the female side of things. So males inherit the mitochondrial DNA, and mitochondria has its own DNA, just as chloroplasts uh, do as well. And those that's inherited only from the maternal side. Okay? So if you're a male, you not only have the nuclear genetic material of your father and mother, but you also have mitochondrial genetic material from your mother as well. So because of that, it's, you, can, you can trace relationships much more precisely using a mitochondrial uh, genetic material. So, the genetic results showed a clear grouping of six gill sharks from Belize, the Bahamas, and Gulf of Mexico, which varied considerably from the sharks found near Japan, Madagascar, and other Indo-Pacific locales. The findings are uh, reported in the journal Marine Biodiversity, which was published in the January 14th issue. Be uh, uh, Professor Daly Engel uh, says, because we now know there are two unique species, we have a sense of the overall variation in population of six gills. We understand if we overfish one of them, they will not replenish from elsewhere in the world. So this is important information from a biodiversity point of view and from sustainability point of view. You can't just overfish and say, oh, uh, some, some uh, members from the Indian Ocean will swim into the Atlantic. That's not the case. So that's, uh, so like everything else in science, new discoveries are always being made. And uh, or new analyses, new insights are being ascertained, and it, it adds to our understanding of everything. Okay, the next story. Unlikely cousins, whales and hippos. Well, I did a, uh, a special video on evolution uh, exclusively for my uh, Patreon subscribers, where we talked about uh, the, the sequence of events that led to how whales form, and it was uh, considered that whales typically descended from some sort of ungulate, but they thought like a cow or a pig. Well, could be a hippo. Hippos are also ungulates, if I recall correctly. One theory has it that hippos are related to pigs. Yet mounting evidence suggests that they are closer to whales. A new study concludes that a four-footed semi-aquatic mammal that thrived for some 40 million years was a common ancestor to both whales and hippos. 
The problem with hippos, if you look at its general shape, it seems to be related to horses. In fact, the, the hippopotamus is basically from the Greek meaning uh, water horse. So that's what the ancient Greeks thought and si modern scientists thought pigs. Molecular phylogeny shows a close relationship with whales, said Jean-Renaud Bossieri, uh, Jean Bossieri, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California at Berkeley. Cetaceans, whales, porpoises and dolphins obviously don't look anything like hippos, but of course when you have an extended period of time over millions of years, tens of millions of years, you can get different morphologies. So Basseri and colleagues in France say they filled in the gap with fossils of an animal that liked to be in water into two groups, early cetaceans and a group of four-legged animals called anthracotheres. The pig-like anthracotheres, which developed at least 37 distinct genera, died out less than two and a half million years ago, leaving only one line, the hippopotamus. The analysis puts whales within a group of club and hooked mammals called Arteodactyla. Arteodactyla are typically called even-toed ungulates. Cows, pigs, goats, moose, caribou, deer. Okay, you get the idea. There is another group of ungulates, ungulates are of course hooked animals, called the Parasodactyla. Parasodactyla are sometimes referred to as odd-toed ungulates. Horses, tapirs are the, probably the best known examples of that. The idea that whales and hippos could be related is uh, gaining uh, momentum. And Bosseri's team analyzed new and previous hippo, whale, and anthracotheri fossils to pin down anthro anthracotheries as the missing link to, between the hippos and cetaceans. So, uh, it's very interesting uh, giving a uh, little further information on the evolutionary uh, relationship of whales, where they came from, what the, who they might be uh, related to. Uh, as I said, I did an extensive uh, video um, discussing uh, evolution and using the evolution uh, sequence of whales as an example. Uh, for example, uh, example, there was a, a group called Ambulocetus uh, natans, which literally, ambulo means walking, cetans refers to cetaceans, whale, natans refers to uh, swimming. So literally translate as a walking whale that swims. <laughs> so, uh, so this was obviously one of the transitional forms uh, in the process of the uh, evolution of the whales. So anyway, I just wanted to bring you some uh, some nice stories, filling in some, uh, giving us more information on uh, organisms, both uh, living and where they came from. So uh, if you uh, like this video, please share the video, please subscribe, hit the bell, and I uh, hope you'll consider uh, supporting my work by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Uh, forward slash science talk with Jim Massa. If you're already a patron, thank you for your continued support. We'll talk soon.